Good morning, everybody, and welcome to worship today. Just before we go any further, a couple of announcements. We had arranged that people could bring, if they wished, free will offering envelopes or offerings to the church on the third Saturday of March. And just with the state of things at the moment, the committee have decided to postpone that to the 17th of April. That's the third Saturday in April. So uh, be patient with us on that, please, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. And in the meantime, does anyone fancy a chat? Wouldn't you just love to see some of your friends from Cairn Castle and have a wee bit of a yarn, a wee bit of a catch up? Well, we're going to try and give you that opportunity best we can. One of the things that I've had to learn in the last few months is how to Zoom. And uh, that means going online, yes, on the internet and uh, looking up Zoom and putting in a couple of numbers and that gets you into a, a meeting. Now, you sit in your own front room, but you get to join with other people and you can see their face and hear their voice and we can have a little bit of chat together. So the uh, session in the committee, we've been doing this and it's been very enjoyable and very profitable. We'd like to give members of the congregation the opportunity to try this as well. So on Friday the 12th of March, we're going to have a Friday conversation. That's what we're calling it. It's not a Bible study. It's not a really deep academic thing, but a conversation. And members of the congregation are invited to join us. Now, if you can get internet access and if you can go on Zoom, we're going to have the numbers. I'll have the numbers or the elders will have the numbers. So contact myself or your elder for more details if you would like to join in that. It'll be about 8 o'clock to about 9 o'clock, Friday the 12th. A wee bit of an opportunity to chat about some of our experiences through lockdown, to read a little bit of scripture together, and to pray together and encourage one another. If you'd be interested, do please get in touch. Now, let's worship God. We're going to read some verses from Psalm 57. David in the Old Testament was uh, not facing a pandemic or lockdown restrictions as such, but his movements were certainly uh, restricted and very limited because of his psychotic father-in-law, King Saul, who was hunting him down and trying to kill him. And so on this occasion, David had had to take refuge, go into hiding in a cave and yet, even in those restricted conditions and quite threatening conditions, he chose to pray and to praise God and to trust in God that God's faithfulness would deliver him and help him. Uh, listen to these words from Psalm 57. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre, I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Amen. May God bless his word to us today. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we haven't been hiding in a cave uh, under threat of, of, of being murdered, but we have been struggling with the restrictions uh, due to the, the lockdown. But we choose to, like David, praise you and to lift up your name and to rejoice that you're not threatened. You are still very much enthroned over all your creation and all that happens. And so we praise you, we thank you for your mercies thus far, and we trust you for today and for the days which are ahead. We come to you in Jesus' name and ask that for his sake you would forgive our sin. We pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and that you would give us understanding of your word today as to what it really means to be a Christian, a believer, 
a follower of Jesus. Dear Lord, put in our hearts this real desire, this real zeal to want to, to serve and obey you and bring honour and glory to your name. So, dear Lord, meet with your people today as we worship you from our homes, from many different locations. Be present with us by your Spirit and lead us in your way. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, one of our elders, Mark, is going to read to us from Luke chapter 5. And after that, one of our young people, Megan, is going to lead us in worship with a lovely song, Bless the Lord, O My Soul. Good morning and welcome to Glenarm Harbour for today's reading, which is taken from Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, reading from verse 1. One day Jesus was standing on the shore of Lake Gansarat while the people pushed their way up to him to listen to the word of God. He saw two boats pulled up on the beach. The fishermen had left them and were washing the nets. Jesus got into one of the boats, it belonged to Simon, and asked him to push it off a little from the shore. Jesus sat in the boat and taught the crowd. When he finished speaking, he said to Simon, push the boat out further to the deep water and you and your partners let down your nets for a catch. Master Simon answered, We worked hard all night long and caught nothing, but if you say so, I will let down the nets. They let them down and caught such a large number of fish that the nets were about to break. So they motioned to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled both boats so full of fish that the boats were about to sink. When Simon Peter saw what happened, he fell on his knees before Jesus and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. He and the others with him were all amazed at the large number of fish they had caught. The same was true of Simon's partners James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. They pulled the boats up on the beach, left everything, and followed Jesus. Amen. Just before our next reading and the sermon today, we are going to show you a little video that has been produced by the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. Lockdown has been many things for, for all of us, and many people are asking questions. We've all wondered uh, what, what it's all about, and uh, there have been inevitable questions and maybe some of your friends or family have been asking uh, things and, and deep searching questions and this is an opportunity for Christians to share a little bit of the hope and the comfort and the assurance that we find in Jesus. So the, our denomination has produced this little evangelistic video. We're going to show it to you now as part of the service today. 
We're also going to put it on our church website. You'll find it on kerncastlepresbyterian.org under mission. And we are invited, encouraged to share it with friends. So you'll be able to find it there. And what we'd really like you to do is to uh, share it on social media with some of your family and friends. And take it as an occasion, an opportunity to chat about your faith and the hope and the comfort that you have found in the Lord Jesus. Let's watch the video now, shall we? What challenges have come crashing into your life through the COVID-19 pandemic? Working from home, isolation, homeschooling, financial pressure, caring for vulnerable relatives, missing people, fear of sickness, loss of a loved one. Any one of these things brings its own pressure, but given that many of these things are coming like wave after wave, one after the other, is it any wonder that sometimes we feel like we can't get our head above water? All the uncertainty we find ourselves experiencing and our inability to talk to others about what we are facing can seem overwhelming at times leaving us feeling like we are drowning, exhausted and anxious about what might slip away from our grasp next. Do you ever have moments where you've reached your limits and feel like you're sinking? Does it sometimes feel like there's so much change in life right now that it's hard to be sure about anything? Have you ever wished there was a way you could feel like your life was more secure? Perhaps just now, we all feel a bit like a boat that's being tossed about by the wind and waves, completely at the mercy of the storm and chaos all around us. But what if it didn't have to be like that? What if this boat had an anchor that keeps it safe through the storm? The Bible borrows this image of an anchor to picture the hope that Christians find in God. So what is this hope that can keep our lives firm and secure? And wouldn't we like to have it just now? This hope is founded in our lives being connected to God, a God who is unchanging, a God who always keeps his promises, a God who loves us and stepped down into the uncertainties of life when he came into the world in Jesus. He made himself vulnerable. He encountered anxiety. He faced a fearful death on the cross as he took on the rescue of a world gone astray. And he overcame all of that, rising again from the dead, returning again to heaven to get a grip on life's messiness, inviting us to steady the ship of our lives by depending on him for everything. One day Jesus will return in victory and all uncertainty, fear and anxiety, even death, will be driven out of our lives and world. But what about here and now? Anchoring our life to Jesus and God's promises doesn't mean that the storms of life will disappear or that we can expect everything to be plain sailing from now on. The boat will still be tossed about by the changing winds of the storm. We still have to face our fears and anxieties like everyone else. But under the surface, we have a deeper security and hope by knowing our lives are ultimately anchored to Jesus and safe in God's hands. Would you like to have that sort of steadying influence in your life? Might you be sensing the need for a hope like this that exists beyond your own ability to manage everything? Have you ever taken the time to properly explore what Christians believe, the life of Jesus, what he said and what he offers to you? Perhaps you could start today by speaking to someone you know who is a Christian or contacting a church near where you live. We hear God's word from Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, reading from verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. What about you? he asked. 
Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the Father's glory and with the holy angels. Amen. And may God bless his word to us here today. Now, it might seem like a contradiction in terms, but the first thing we have in our gospel readings today is an obvious conclusion. Peter and Andrew, James and John have been accompanying Jesus of Nazareth for some weeks and months now. And they have witnessed some really astounding things. He is not only an eloquent speaker, an excellent teacher. He talks about God and he seems to really know what he's talking about. His message is authoritative, as evidenced by the miracles he is performing. Now this isn't sleight of hand or some kind of scam. There's no clever camera work or computer-generated special effects here. Just thousands of eyewitnesses and changed lives. Thousands of people fed from one lunchbox. Countless people healed from all kinds of serious illness and disability. Countless more set free from the influence of evil spirits. Now, it's worth noting that by this point, uh, Jesus has also calmed a storm on the Sea of Galilee and walked on the water, if you please. So when Jesus asks his disciples who they think he is, Peter's answer comes really as no surprise. You're the Christ, the Messiah. The king, especially anointed and equipped by heaven. The rescuer promised by the Old Testament prophets. The son of God. It's surely obvious. No one else could say or do such things. And Peter's right. Jesus doesn't deny it. He just cautions them to be discreet with this knowledge in the meantime. So far, so good. But next, we have a surprising revelation. <laughs> These boys imagine that they're going to ride a wave of popularity with Jesus all the way to the capital, Jerusalem. And they're anticipating when they're there, likely he'll perform some more miracles and be crowned king by the people's demand. And behind his awesome power that people will unite and gain their independence from Rome and the twelve of them will be his right hand men. Instead, their master begins to speak about opposition, suffering, execution. This won't be easy, man. If you follow me, you must expect some difficulty and be prepared to sacrifice. Okay, so let's recap a little and make sure we're understanding this correctly. 
We already know from Jesus' early preaching that if we want to be in God's kingdom at all, we need to repent of all that God says is wrong and believe the good news being announced and demonstrated by Jesus the King. We've got that. In Luke 5 that Mark read for us, Jesus calls us to follow him, to be his disciples, to learn from him and to serve him. With a, a twinkle in his eye, he tells these fishermen that this will involve going out and catching people for his kingdom. Our Lord certainly has a sense of humour. But he also speaks most seriously about things that are true and that really matter. For example, in his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6 and 7, he's been saying that the subjects of God's kingdom must strive to practice righteousness that surpasses the Pharisees. And our Heavenly Father seems less concerned with outer show, more concerned that we control some of the murderous, adulterous thoughts inside our hearts and minds. <laughs> that would be challenging enough. But now Jesus is telling his friends that he and they will have to face unpopularity and persecution. His kingdom involves sacrifice in the short term. Before the glory of heaven and resurrection, there will be a cross. Peter doesn't understand this yet. He would much prefer the popular approach. But he and the others are learning. And that brings us a third thing to note in these readings. An invitation to learn from Jesus. And what are some lessons that the Lord might want us to learn from his word today, from these readings? One might be the value of a human soul. What is your life, your soul worth? Well, let me ask you some questions. Do you have some family and friends? Do you have someone who loves you? Somewhere to belong? That's really precious. Do you have employment at the moment? Do you have a job? Do you have some income? Very useful. What about, do you have a nice home? Have you a fairly decent car? Do you have some cool devices? Well, health to enjoy. But let me ask you, what good are all of these if your life and soul remain under condemnation before God's throne? What could be more valuable than your life itself? What prophet asks Jesus if we gain everything in worldly terms but forfeit the opportunity to live and share eternity with him. Now, by comparison with uh, some of these worldly things, we might learn the value of non-physical treasure, like the truth of the gospel. There's nothing more precious than this, more relevant and powerful than the love of Jesus bringing forgiveness, new life through the Holy Spirit. This gospel presented and demonstrated by his committed followers. No better reason for living or dying than to share this good news in obedience to Jesus. Here is something worth giving up our, our time, energy, resources for. That people everywhere might know of our King and have an opportunity to trust in Him. Now, learning these fundamental lessons from Jesus brings us to a final point from today's scripture. And it is a challenge to serve. This is something that Peter and the others are struggling 
to understand that to serve in Christ's kingdom is not about being popular, gaining recognition and earthly prestige. Our king was going to humble himself to death on a cross and he calls us to follow, even if it means personal challenge, even sacrifice. Instead of personally seeking praise or making a name for ourselves, we want to be identified with Jesus. We celebrate him. We seek to turn people's attention to him. We strive to make him known, even should it prove unpopular in some quarters. Well, have we got these points today? Have we heard the, the, the obvious conclusion that Jesus is the Christ, the Saviour King, the Son of God? Have we tried to appreciate the surprising revelation, this unexpected turn as he begins to prepare his disciples for the cross? Are we willing to learn as disciples ourselves the things that are vital and the things that are not? Will we take on board his challenge to serve and through times easy or hard, rediscover the joy of sharing his gospel? As they used to say years ago, good news is for sharing. Let's not be neglectful of or selfish with the wonderful good news of grace that Jesus offers. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Dear Lord, thank you for the challenging call to be disciples. To not just believe and benefit from this gospel, but to be committed to share this good news with others. It may not always be popular. Some people may not thank us for it, but others will. And what a privilege to be used by you. For your Holy Spirit to indwell us and use us to fish for for other men and women and boys and girls and encourage other people to come and trust in Jesus too. Yes, Lord, make it so. Use us here in Cairn Castle and in our workplaces and our school classes and university classes. Dear Lord, take us and help us to be fishers for people. And to you be thanks and praise and glory. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.
Yeah.